So as I just said a few minutes back, uh, we can employ some extremely simplifying situations uh, and assumptions and obtain the analytical solutions to the governing equations that we just uh, looked at. Uh, so we will go through a few of these situations, there are plenty more available in, in the literature. Normally in an undergraduate fluid mechanics course, um, we discuss only one or two of these. Um, some others which I have taken here, so there are some uh, five or six that we will be uh, talking about. Some others are really from heat transfer if you, uh, if you look at them carefully. But since we have chosen to include the energy equation as part of our governing equations, um, the solution of the energy equation will be also taken up in a couple of situations. Formally those would be considered as um, heat transfer situations. However, uh, this course is a CFD HT course and in that sense uh, we are going to deal with little bit of heat transfer as well. Uh, we won't spend too much time on the heat transfer part. Uh, some of the people who are already familiar with the heat transfer uh, courses uh, would probably recognize those uh, solutions uh, very fast. But other than, uh, other than that we are not going to spend too much time on the heat transfer solutions. We will just outline the procedure and uh, I will point out uh, if you want to look up into any of the books later uh, where you can see the complete detail. I have worked out actually a reasonable amount of detail, but the complete detail then I will point out where to look for as far as the heat transfer problems are concerned. So let us just start looking at some of the problems. I have listed which ones that uh, we are going to talk about here. Uh, five or six situations. So let's just uh, begin with this. Normally, some of these are taught in our advanced fluid mechanics course, which is uh, a postgraduate course. Uh, but nonetheless, it's worthwhile looking at those right now. So the first situation that we will take up is uh, what is called as a fully developed flow between infinite parallel plates. So the problem setting is shown on the on the screen right now. What we have is uh, let's say two very large plates. By large I mean that their area of cross sections are very large or the area in their own plane is very large and they are separated by a small distance which is uh, h and this uh, space between the two parallel plates is, uh, is filled with a viscous fluid. Now we call this infinite for the purpose of uh, formulation of the problem. Uh, essentially infinite is supposed to mean that the spacing between the two plates is much smaller than either the length or the width into the plane of the paper of these plates. Uh, the coordinate system is shown, we will choose y equal to 0 at the bottom plate, y equal to h at the top plate. The assumptions that we are going to employ and these are very important to note because under these assumptions only we are in a position to solve these equations. So assumptions are that we will deal with steady constant density flow. We will neglect body forces. Uh, what infinitely large plate is supposed to mean is that essentially there is no third component of the velocity in the z direction which is perpendicular to the plane of the board. Uh, the, the reason for this in one way you can, uh, you can uh, say is that there are no boundary conditions to be employed on the z direction and in absence of any boundary conditions, you will not generate any, uh, any variation in the z direction. So because of the 2D nature of the flow then, we will treat uh, third component w equal to 0 and any variable that you can think of will not have any variation in the z direction. So that the differentiation with respect to z of any variable is equal to 0. This is because there is no boundary condition that can be employed in the z direction, z direction being infinitely large. So the, uh, the, this is how that d dz of an empty bracket is supposed to be uh, implying that the em empty bracket can contain any variable and um, let it be pressure, let it be density, whatever it is, there will be no variation in the z direction. Finally, 
we will employ what is called as the fully developed flow situation. What fully developed flow means is that uh, physically speaking the actual velocity will not be changing with actual distance. That is what is formally meant by fully developed flow. So, in terms of mathematical representation it is the partial derivative of u which is our actual velocity with respect to x which is our actual distance equal to 0 and immediately that implies that the u velocity is not going to be a function of x. In fact, if you remember this was the setting really that we used right on uh, day 1 when we discussed the, uh, the expression for um, dynamic viscosity mu tau is equal to mu times du dy is what we had obtained long time back and that setting really was exactly what you see right now here. Uh, so, it is good to uh, good to revisit that. Now, the where is this fully developed condition coming from and there is no analytical basis for it really speaking. It is a purely experimental observation that uh, um, if, if you have a sufficiently large length of a channel or a pipe uh, experimentally you find that after a certain distance after the flow enters in the channel or pipe after a certain distance it simply seems to follow this expression namely that the actual velocity becomes independent of actual direction. So, this fully developed condition has a purely experimental basis it has no theoretical basis so to say uh, it is found to occur time and again in large pipelines or large um, uh, channels uh, in terms of the length I am talking about large meaning and therefore, uh, we will employ this as a simplifying assumption in our problem. So, what we are going to do is we will take the continuity equation, we will take the momentum equation and we will try to step by step simplify these to see what happens under the given assumptions. So, begin with the continuity equation, we have divergence of velocity equal to 0 in our 2D situation it is du dx plus dv dy equal to 0. With the fully developed condition in we already know that du dx equal to 0. So, I have crossed that out which means that what is left out of the continuity equation is only that partial derivative of v with respect to y is 0 which immediately implies that v is v is not a function of y. So, v can be a function of only x because partial derivative of v with respect to y is 0. So, v can be only a function of x. So, let us see what this function of x has to be. Now, so far when we discussed our governing equations yesterday and earlier in the morning, we never talked about the boundary conditions and uh, in, in some sense I did that on purpose because as we are going to solve these um, analytical solutions, we will actually talk about the boundary conditions that we normally employ in uh, typical fluid flow situations. So, going back to our setting what we have is two plates. Okay. So, we will essentially assume that these two plates are solid in the sense that they are not porous and therefore, there can be no flow flowing in a normal direction across the plate. It is a impermeable solid surface which then means that at both y equal to 0 or y equal to h because there is no flow across the plates we have v velocity equal to 0. Remember that if there was supposed to be any mass flow rate across a horizontal surface such as the bottom plate or top plate there has to be a non-zero vertical component of velocity because only a vertical component will carry mass flow rate across a horizontal surface uh, keep that in mind. Therefore, the boundary condition that is employed is that v is equal to 0 at y equal to 0 or h and the only way you can satisfy this boundary condition is basically to assume that this f of x has to be identically 0. Otherwise, you will never satisfy v equal to 0 at y equal to 0 or h. So, the conclusion that we obtain from here is that this so called function x which the velocity v was is actually identically equal to 0 and in fact that implies that the velocity in the y direction in this situation itself is identically equal to 0. So, this is an important uh, conclusion and it actually comes from the fact 
that we have a fully developed situation. So, we are going to talk about these fully developed situations a couple of times. Right now, we are talking about them in a pair of flat plates. Later, we will talk about it in a, in a pipe of circular cross section. You will see that whenever you employ this uh, fully developed condition, which is um, axial velocity is independent of axial direction, you will see that the lateral velocity, so in this case it is the v velocity, turns out to be 0 if you have impermeable bounding surfaces. So, it is something that, uh, that you should uh, keep in mind. So, the boundary condition in words is uh, written on the slide as well that it is 0 technically it is relative velocity with respect to the solid surface. If our surface is stationary, it will be the absolute velocity, but when we want to write it in a more general fashion, we write it as 0 relative normal velocity at the solid surface as our v velocity and that is equal to 0 at both y equal to 0 and at y equal to h. Right. So, the conclusion from a continuity equation is that there is no y component of velocity. Then we will go to the y momentum equation, which is the lateral momentum equation. Under our uh, governing uh, equations, we, we had seen this of course, and uh, under our assumptions that there will be no body force and, and so on, we write the momentum equation in the y direction in a non-conservative form. So, for such analytical solutions, it does not matter what form you use. In fact, many times it is convenient to use the non-conservative form. So, that is what you will uh, see that I am using most of the times during this uh, set of slides. So, uh, the first line writes the y momentum equation in Cartesian coordinates. Remember, we are dealing with uh, 2D situation because we said that w etcetera are 0. So, I am just going to write uh, 2D form. And then I am writing this uh, explicitly opening the substantial derivative. Remember that we assumed steady flow. So, when we, when we look at the substantial derivative, there is a local derivative and then there is a convective derivative. Local derivative will be identically equal to 0, because we are dealing with a steady flow situation. So, what is written out on the last line on the slide is simply the opened up substantial derivative and that will show only the convective derivative. But let us see what is happening to the convective derivative. We said that from the continuity equation, we arrived at the conclusion that v velocity is identically equal to 0 everywhere. So, if you look at v velocity as a mathematical function, it is equal to 0 everywhere. So, the derivative of a 0 function everywhere is going to be also 0 and therefore, this uh, d v d x term in the first, uh, first term of the convective derivative will go away. Similarly, the second term will go away because v itself is 0. Exactly the same thing will happen on, um, um, on the second term on the right hand side, which is our viscous term mu multiplied by Laplacian operating on v. So, since the function v is identically equal to 0 everywhere, we say that we will see that rather uh, the derivative and the second derivative are also equal to 0. Uh, this is important to note because this is an identically 0 function. So, that is the that is what we are trying to point out. So, what is left out then here is only the pressure gradient d p d y and all other terms are found to be 0 and therefore, we are going to conclude that there is no pressure gradient in the y direction or d p d y is equal to 0. So, this is the way these analytical solutions are worked out. Um, one by one, you take the continuity equation, uh, simplify it based on our uh, assumptions, see what conclusion comes out, move on to the next equation, which is presently we have just looked at the y momentum equation. Finally, going to the x momentum equation, again for steady flow, I have written it only as convective derivative. Now, with the discussion that we have already had, you will see that the entire convective derivative will go away, because either du dx is 0 or v is equal to 0. Similarly, du dx 
is 0, which is our um, uh, fully developed condition, which means that d u d x as a function is identically equal to 0 is what that means. So, the, the first term in this uh, uh, viscous term, the uh, Laplacian of u, we have d 2 u d x squared, which you can write as d d x of d u d x, but if d u d x is an identically 0 function everywhere, the derivative of d u d x is also going to be 0 everywhere, identical. I, we are not talking about a local point where uh, d u d x is 0, it is 0 everywhere in the domain. So, it is a identically 0 function and that is the reason the uh, derivative, second derivative with respect to u is also uh, set to 0. We have already derived from the y momentum equation the conclusion that pressure is not a function of y, which means that it can be a function of only x and therefore, there is no need to write a partial derivative for the x and that is why I have started writing this as a total derivative of x with uh, uh, for, for pressure. So, d p d x is what is written with the total derivative um, and that remains to be equal to mu multiplied by d 2 u d y squared that is the only surviving term from our x momentum equation. Now, again if you go here right at the beginning as a result of our uh, uh, fully developed flow assumption, we had immediately concluded that u is not a function of x. So, it is only a function of y and therefore, this uh, partial derivative of u with respect to y, the second one, second derivative is not really required to be written as a partial derivative and that is precisely what I have written. So, now let us look at what has happened. This is a very important step again. On the left, I have d p d x, which we are calling as at most a function of x. The reason is because we have already worked out that um, p is not a function of y from our previous uh, equation. So, therefore, the derivative of p with respect to x can be at most a function of x. Similarly, the second derivative of y, so second derivative of u with respect to y can be at most a function of y. But the way the equation states is that the left hand side which can be a function of at most x is equal to a function of at most y. So, the only way this can be possible is that both sides are equal to a constant. That is the only way this equation will have any physical meaning whatsoever. And therefore, we are in a position to conclude here that both the left hand side which is written in terms of the pressure gradient or the right hand side which is in written in terms of mu times the second derivative of u with respect to y are independently equal to the same constant. So, what is done now is that in order for us to find the velocity field in this problem, we then assume that the pressure gradient in the x direction is a known constant. So, let us assume that it is a known constant and therefore, after assuming this to be the known constant, we are in a position to integrate this mu times d 2 u d y squared equal to a known constant with respect to y twice and that is precisely what I have done and written the expression for u as a function of y, which will obviously involve two constants of integration, because we have derived, uh, we have, uh, we have integrated this twice with respect to y. So, what remains in this expression is the pressure gradient term in the actual direction and that pressure gradient term is going to be assumed to be known or specified as part of the problem, although it was not really given here. I wanted to point out that as a result of the simplifications, you come to a conclusion where you are forced to essentially say that unless I assume one of the two to be constant, I cannot go anywhere. Okay. So, the customary procedure in, uh, these, uh, in, in these analytical solutions is to assume that the pressure gradient is known and then you are in a position to integrate the reduced x momentum equation as we call it. So, this is the reduced x momentum equation and obtain the velocity field uh, 
which as we expected right from the slide one number one is going to be only a function of y. So, the only thing that remains to be determined now is the two integration constants a and b for which uh, we will consider it the two separate cases. So, the case one would be that both plates are stationary and this is what is called as a plain Poiseuille flow in which case the boundary conditions are the following. Now, just like we had a boundary condition on the v velocity, we assume that there is no relative normal velocity because the, the plates were considered to be impermeable solid. The other boundary condition for the actual velocity or the uh, x direction velocity is essentially that the relative tangential velocity meaning in the x direction at a solid surface which is either at y equal to 0 or at y equal to h will be equal to 0 and this is what is called as the no slip condition. So, the no slip condition is again a, a boundary condition that is coming from purely experimental observations. So, people have observed time and again that um, in continuum flows what appears to happen is that as you go closer and closer to a solid surface which is stationary and which is bounding the flow, what is found is that the relative tangential velocity if it is a stationary surface it becomes an absolute velocity. So, the absolute velocity in case of a stationary solid surface uh, tangential direction at the surface is equal to 0. This is what is popularly called as the no slip condition and again there is no theoretical basis for this no slip condition for continuum flows the kinds of flows that we are talking about under continuum assumptions this is found to be always the case from a purely experimental point of view and therefore, we are choosing this as one of the boundary conditions to be employed on the actual velocity in the x direction in this case. So, if you go back and substitute u is equal to 0 at both y equal to 0 and at y equal to h, you can easily evaluate these constants a and b and finally, the velocity field which turns out to be a velocity profile because it is only a function of y is written in the, the middle box on the slide right now. So, again just to summarize how we have gone about, we started with the continuity equation, simplified it under the given assumptions, got some conclusions, then moved on to the y momentum equation, simplified it got some conclusion, moved on to the x momentum equation, simplified it, realized that it was a situation where one of the two terms that was left in the x momentum equation had to be assumed as a constant. So, for the purpose of um, sticking to how the literature moves, um, we have chosen the actual gradient as actual pressure gradient as the known constant and assuming the actual pressure gradient as a known constant we have integrated this uh, uh, reduced x momentum to find out the velocity field which turns out to be as we say a velocity profile. So, this is case number 1. The other case which is considered here is that the lower plate is stationary and the upper plate at y equal to h is moving with a constant velocity u and capital U that is and this is what is called as a quiet flow situation. So, the boundary conditions then is that there is again 0 relative tangential velocity at a solid surface. So, the lower surface is stationary. So, the relative velocity is essentially equal to 0 for the uh, for the fluid. Uh, it will also be having that means a 0 velocity. At the top surface at y equal to h because the, the top plate itself is moving at uh, a constant speed of capital U and if there has to be no relative tangential velocity between the fluid and the plate at y equal to h, we essentially say that the fluid will also have the same velocity as the surface which is equal to capital U and therefore, the boundary condition here at y equal to h which is written out at the bottom uh, of, the, of the transparency is that the u velocity is equal to capital U at y equal to h. 
So, with these two conditions go back to your uh, general form and evaluate the constants a and b and you will realize that this is how the velocity field which is again a velocity uh, profile shows up. So, let us just see how these two situations look like. So, that is what I have tried to uh, tried to show here on the on the sketch. So, our case number 1 was the plane Poiseuille flow and if you go back uh, remember h is a constant, mu is a constant and we assumed d p d x also as a constant as part of the solution. So, the entire uh, multiplying factor to, to this square bracket is a constant. What is left is essentially a square variation or y squared variation I should say, which is essentially a parabolic variation and that is what is uh, shown as the u velocity profile in the Poiseuille flow, plane Poiseuille flow which is a parabolic profile. Uh, obviously, many of you have seen a similar parabolic profile in um, flow inside a pipe of circular cross section. So, this plane Poiseuille flow is exactly same is just that it is a counter part of that um, circular Poiseuille flow as it is called um, fully developed laminar flow in, um, in a pipe of circular cross section. So, here we are doing the same problem in two dimensions where we are talking about a, a channel that that is about it. Going back to the uh, quiet flow part you uh, you see this uh, at the bottom you will see that the u velocity has two parts one is a linear variation with y and then there is a uh, parabolic variation again which comes through as the second part. So, in, in case of quiet flow uh, and there was a question asked on quiet flow uh, I think couple of days back as well. So, we can uh, we can note this down right now. In case of quiet flow even if you assume this axial pressure gradient to be 0 you still get a non-zero solution and the reason is because it is that upper plate which is moving at a constant velocity equal to capital U will transmit its momentum through the action of viscosity to the, the bottom layers in the fluid subsequently lower layers in the fluid and that motion of the top layer through the action of viscosity will will maintain actually create as well as maintain the flow. In addition if you have the actual pressure gradient that is not a problem because you can add that through the second term, but even if the actual pressure gradient is identically equal to 0 in case of quiet flow the flow will still be non-zero because of the motion of the top plate. And that is what I have tried to show that the typical situations where you have no actual pressure gradient you will get that linear profile as was uh, shown by u multiplied by y over h the second term will be exactly equal to 0 in that case. And then there are two possibilities one which we call as a favorable pressure gradient which is given by d p d x less than 0 which simply means that as you go in the direction of the flow the pressure is decreasing. So, is going from a higher value to a lower value which means that the pressure gradient which is defined as p later minus p earlier divided by the distance is, is negative this is what is called as a favorable pressure gradient. So, let me just write that on the whiteboard. So, if, if I want to roughly plot it, it could be in, in general uh, this is our x direction the pressure could be something like this. Uh, it does not have to be necessarily linear or whatever. So, I have, I have just shown it as uh, a, a, a dropping pressure as you move in the direction of the flow. So, this is what is called as a favorable pressure gradient and it will try to accelerate the flow in in the direction of positive x axis. So, going back again. So, in the case of uh, a favorable pressure gradient what you generate is a velocity profile that is given by this curve b. The third option is that the pressure gradient can be positive 
and that is what is called as an adverse pressure gradient. So, let me go back to my whiteboard. So, again if I want to come up with a sketch, it can be in general something like this. So, the flow is going this way along the positive x direction and the, the pressure as a function of x can look something like this, which means that as you are moving in the positive x direction, the flow actually encounters increasing pressure. So, in that sense, the flow is moving against a higher and higher pressure value in, in a situation like an adverse pressure gradient. So, the only way it is possible is, uh, is because um, you have uh, the motion of the top plate driving the flow. That is the only reason it is possible that the, the flow can move against an adverse pressure gradient. So, keep that in mind that if you remove the, the motion from the top plate, if you make the plate uh, stationary just like the plane Poiseuille flow. Uh, and if you have an adverse pressure gradient as what is shown by this uh, C expression, it will actually reverse its direction and it will start moving in the negative x direction. So, the only reason why the flow is able to move against an adverse pressure gradient is because the top plate is trying to overcome it through the, the motion of its own uh, uh, motion of its own. So, in case of uh, this adverse pressure gradient, the kind of velocity profile that you generate in this squared flow is given by this C curve. So, what we are going to do is uh, we will actually solve uh, during our lab session uh, tomorrow a transient uh, problem which is a transient squared problem. So, this is a steady state problem meaning that it is a time independent problem. What we are going to do is we will solve a transient quiet flow in the lab session. So, what that means is that we will start with a situation when at time equal to 0 because it is a transient or time dependent problem. At time equal to 0 both plates will be stationary and then at time equal to 0 suddenly you let the top plate start moving with a velocity equal to capital U. At the same time you impose an actual pressure gradient. Um, and then as time evolves, you find out how the flow develops. Eventually, the flow will become steady and depending on whether you have 0 axial pressure gradient, favorable axial pressure gradient or adverse axial pressure gradient, in the steady state, you will generate the solution which will be looking like either A or B or C and we will verify that this indeed happens uh, in the lab session tomorrow afternoon. In the meantime, uh, this was the first case which I wanted to discuss as part of our uh, exact solutions. So, moving on uh, the, the same problem actually, uh, this one I do not want to discuss completely because this is not per se a fluid mechanics problem, this is actually a convection heat transfer problem. However, the idea was that since we have talked about the energy equation. Let me try to outline how the energy equation situation will be solved in the same problem that we were discussing, namely the, the plane Poiseuille flow situation. So, I have chosen that we will, uh, we will deal with the plane Poiseuille flow, where both plates are essentially now uh, stationary. So, that the velocity profile has already been determined, which is our uh, parabolic profile and the specific expression is here on slide number 5. So, that profile is already existing in the in the flow. In addition, what we are saying is that let there be a constant heat flux imposed on both the top plate and the bottom plate. So, that constant heat flux over the entire length of course, uh, I am showing by this uh, set of arrows uh, and I have written this q suffix x with two primes which is supposed to mean that this is a heat flux and let us assume that this is a constant heat flux. Uh, 
So, what is going to happen is that the uh, the heat transfer into the fluid is going to start heating up the fluid as, as you can imagine and uh, because of that the temperature within the fluid will start increasing as you go from the left end to the right end. So, at any particular axial location if you want to look because the, the surface is heating the fluid a temperature profile can be imagined where you have a higher temperature at the surface and then as you get into the bulk of the fluid the temperature will gradually reduce will reach some sort of a minimum and since the problem is symmetric about y equal to h by 2, it will again go back and reach a uh, surface temperature which is higher. So, this is what we expect in a situation like this. Uh, again you know those people who are familiar with uh, convective heat transfer who have taught or um, been through a heat transfer course will realize that uh, we deal with a very very similar situation for flow inside a circular pipe meaning a pipe of circular cross section where there is a laminar fully developed flow uh, already established and then we start heating the, the pipe wall from an external source um, thereby imposing some sort of a constant heat flux uh, situation. So, this is a very similar situation only thing is that we are dealing with a two dimensional uh, parallel channel type situation as we said which is our plane Poiseuille flow. So, in order to find now the solution for the temperature distribution within the flow, we need to solve the energy equation. So, here the way it is going is already we have solved the flow problem in the first few slides. Now, taking that flow problem we will move on and we will try to solve the uh, energy equation to obtain the temperature profile within the flow. So, therefore, what we are going to do is we are going to solve the energy equation for what is called as hydrodynamically fully developed which was our parabolic profile what we obtained earlier and also thermally fully developed flow. So, in addition to assuming that the flow is hydrodynamically th th uh, fully developed, we will also assume that the flow is what is called as thermally fully developed and again the people who are familiar with convective heat transfer, those who have already gone through the heat transfer course that happened uh, in November and December of last year will actually remember this uh, terminology of thermally fully developed situation. Um, so, let us see what that means. Uh, I, I have also shown on the, the sketch here is a, a sort of mean temperature value at the given actual location given by a uniform cross section equal to T suffix m. The magnitude of the uh, mean temperature is given as T suffix m. Essentially, what you are going to do is you are going to realize that this um, profile is a function of y. So, you can appropriately find out an average value and we will discuss that in a minute how to, how to obtain that average value for the temperature profile at a given actual location. We are calling that as either the mean mean temperature or it is also called as the bulk temperature, it is also called as the bulk mean temperature. So, the assumptions are listed at the bottom which is that a constant heat flux is imposed on both the top and bottom walls. Remember the z dimension is infinite, so there are no uh, boundary conditions on the z direction and we assume what is called as a thermally fully developed flow. and uh, Again from heat transfer I am directly utilizing the mathematical expression which determines the nature of this fully developed situations. Again fully developed condition in a thermal situation such as what we are discussing is also a purely experimental observation. Uh, people have determined that this is how uh, the flow behaves if you are uh, if you are heating it uh, either as a constant temperature or a constant heat flux boundary condition and sufficiently downstream from the inlet the flow starts behaving as if it is uh, fully developed in the sense that uh, a relative uh, temperature profile remains unchanged. Uh, you can say that either the temperature profile or temperature relative temperature profile it, it does not matter. Uh, what it means is that although the fluid is going to get continuously heated thereby it will keep on increasing its mean temperature continuously. What we see is that 
a profile uh, such as this um, shown for the temperature remains unchanged with respect to the actual direction and the specific uh, mathematical expression that I have simply picked from the heat transfer uh, part is that the actual gradient or actual, um, actual gradient of a typical ratio defined as the surface temperature minus the temperature within the flow divided by the surface temperature minus the mean bulk temperature. So, it is some way a normalized uh, profile you can say. So, surface temperature is obviously at the surface on the, the, the plate at some actual location. Uh, the mean temperature is of course, as I have shown here as the, the mean of the uh, temperature profile in some sense. We will we'll talk about that mean in a minute. And T comma T of y comma x is any general point on the profile. Okay. So, that is the way to, to interpret it. So, this fully developed condition for thermal situations is again an experimentally found uh, condition and that is what we are going to assume to be the case in this situation. So, if, if, uh, if you recall those who are familiar with uh, the bulk mean temperature idea that it is essentially defined on the basis of the same energy content traveling across a cross section. So, it is what we call a mass averaged uh, uh, temperature if you want in the sense that if you consider a mass flow rate of m dot with a specific heat of C and a mean temperature of T m, you will see that m dot times C times T m is the energy content of that flow crossing a given cross section and that is equated to the energy content that a given situation such as the one that the profile shows here is carrying. And therefore, we equate those energy contents to say that the, the mean bulk temperature then is defined uh, in, in that fashion. So, if you, if you actually work out the, the algebra and again I do not want to spend too much time on these heat transfer problems because it is slightly out of, uh, out of the scope, but because we are using uh, energy equation as part of our governing equations, I am discussing these. Uh, those who really want to know more details at the end of this problem, I will suggest uh, which book you can, you can look at if you want to get the exact more details. So, with this definition of the mean temperature, uh, what, we, what we realize is that uh, we can go and do some simplifications or some uh, manipulations on that condition which, uh, which is our fully developed condition. So, let us go back to our thermally fully developed condition and what we have here is that the derivative with respect to x of some quantity is equal to 0. So, because of that we will say that that quantity is essentially not a function of x. If the derivative with respect to f uh, with with its, with respect to x, uh, if it is uh, if it is zero of a certain quantity, that quantity is not going to be a function of x, and therefore you can take a y derivative of that quantity, and that y derivative is also not going to be a function of x. Having said that, we will carry out this further. You actually uh, uh, employ this y derivative on each of the terms inside. What you will what you will realize is that the surface temperature is only a function of x divided by the new denominator which is a completely function of x. So, y derivative operating on the first term is not going to get you anything it will basically be 0. What is left is then is that the y derivative will operate on the second term in the numerator which is a function of both y and x. So, therefore, that um, partial derivative with respect to y will operate on the t which is the second derivative in the second term in the numerator and divide that of course, by a term which is the surface temperature minus the mean temperature which is just a function of x. So, as far as derivation uh, der derivatives with respect to y are concerned it is a constant. So, what will be left is minus d t dy divided by surface temperature minus the mean temperature. And this we are saying is not a function of x. You multiply this by the constant thermal conductivity of the fluid and you will still have the same expression which will say that minus k times d t dy over that uh, 
difference between the surface temperature and the mean temperature is not a function of x. However, minus k times dt dy if you evaluate at either y equal to 0 or y equal to h will give you using the Fourier's law of heat conduction the heat flux at the surface and that is what precisely what I have written that the heat flux then divided by the surface temperature minus the bulk mean temperature is not a function of x. But if you remember from heat transfer, heat flux divided by surface temperature minus bulk mean temperature is nothing but what is called as a convective heat transfer coefficient. So, what we basically obtain through this set of uh, manipulations is that for fully developed condition in this case, the heat transfer coefficient is not a function of x, it turns out to be a constant. So, now furthermore, if we are dealing with a constant heat flux as what we are saying, it turns out that the heat transfer coefficient is a constant, the heat flux is a constant. Therefore, the denominator here which is the surface temperature minus the bulk mean temperature will also be a constant and then performing a x derivation on this T s minus T m, you realize that the rate at which the surface temperature is changing along the x direction is the same as the rate at which the mean temperature is changing. So, that is one key result. Going back to our standard expression for the thermally fully developed situation, which is the x derivative of surface temperature minus the fluid temperature at any given point, the whole thing divided by surface temperature minus, minus the mean temperature equal to 0. Now, what we just saw is that under the situation of a constant heat flux, surface temperature minus the mean temperature is essentially a constant. So, you can completely remove the denominator from the differentiation process and what is left is that the d by d x will operate on the surface temperature minus it will operate on the general temperature inside the fluid. And therefore, from here for the case of constant heat flux, we, we also obtain that the rate at which the surface temperature is changing along the x direction is equal to the rate at which the fluid temperature at any point within the fluid domain is also changing in the x direction. So, putting these two together, we essentially obtain a very important condition here is that the rate at which the mean temperature or the bulk mean temperature is changing with x is equal to the rate at which the fluid temperature at any particular y location you can say or any y location is also changing with respect to x. So, let me just go back to my whiteboard and um, show this in a slightly more uh, clearer fashion. So, let me draw that uh, profile which roughly looks like this for temperatures. So, at the top we have the surface temperature which is uh, a function of x. So, we are talking about a given actual location at which everything is happening. Since the problem is symmetric, we have uh, surface temperature on the other side as well at y equal to 0 and at y equal to h. And now, so I will just show you a couple of arrows which we usually use to mark the profile that general temperature within the fluid is any general point on the, on the temperature profile. So, it can be here or it can be here or it can be here etcetera. So, keep that in mind. On the other hand, the mean temperature is some sort of an average value and we have already discussed how we calculate that average by equating the energy content of the, the uniform flow uh, in terms of the uh, uniform temperature T, T m. Uh, and the actual energy content of what what is happening inside the channel. And so, that is what this 
final expression is supposed to mean that if you look at how the temperature at any y location is changing with respect to x, it turns out to be exactly the same way as how the mean temperature is also changing with respect to x. So, that is what we have obtained here through these initial discussions of this particular problem. Thank you.